when I was studying intellectual history, I learned that there were basically two ways to approach a text. One is when you have no respect for the author. You feel either he's dumb or he hasn't thought things through. Or he's trying to pull a fast one. He's got an agenda. And you're trying to see through the agenda, trying to point out what's wrong with the text. And it's not hard. But there's another way you can read a text, which is to have respect for the author, to figure out there must be some way in which this text makes sense. And then to figure out what it is, see what the author's assumptions are. Now things build from those assumptions. It's kind of like detective work sometimes. And I found that taking the second approach, I always learn more. It expanded my ideas of how things make sense. So when I went to Thailand, studied with John Fu, and one day he said, Respect is a sign of intelligence. Part of me was surprised, but part of me understood. The part that was surprised, of course, was the, the teenager in me. I always thought that the, the smart kid in the class was the one who could see what was wrong with what the teacher was saying. But then there was a part of me that realized, okay, when I showed respect to a text, I learned from it. It expanded me as a person. And so in the same way, when you come to the Dharma, you show, show some respect for it, you're going to learn, learn a lot of new things. Now this doesn't mean that you come totally unquestioning. After all, the Buddha did encourage cross-questioning when people didn't understand what he was teaching. He encouraged the, a culture in which the teacher was open to cross-questioning all the way to the end of his life. Next to the last thing he asked, or said, before he died was, are there any questions? But there's a way to ask questions that shows respect. And John Fuang's explanation was that you take a teaching and you try to put it into practice, and if it doesn't seem to work out. You try to figure out why. And if you're still not sure, then you go and you ask the teacher. This, of course, is in line with the Buddhist statement that we learn the Dharma through commitment and reflection. You hear a teaching, you don't just say, well, I don't like that teaching, it doesn't make sense to me, so I'm not going to do it. You're not going to learn anything that way. Because after all, you come to the Dharma untrained, and you're here to get a training. And a lot of times you don't understand the training until you've had it, and you see that it actually has a good impact on you. And it doesn't seem to have a good impact, you're trying to figure out why. That's the second part of showing respect. Maybe you misunderstood the instructions. Maybe you didn't put them into practice well. You try to figure out what other meaning could those words have. This is when you begin to grow. You don't just go on your first knee-jerk reactions. You begin to wonder, is there another way? It's like that time when John Fuang told me to use my banya. Up to that point, I'd always translated banya in my mind as wisdom. And that was a point where I was feeling very unwise. And so I said, I have no banya. He says, of course you have banya. Everybody has some banya. It's just a matter of learning how to use it. So I had to go back and think, well, what did he mean? And began to realize that the word banya, poly, anti, is not quite wisdom. I began to realize it meant discernment. And then I thought of the various ways in which John Fung used the word. And the more I listened, the more I noticed that that was the meaning. So I learned. So when we come to the Dharma, we come from a different culture, with a different way of training. We feel that we already are well trained. We've all had schooling. 
But we have to realize, in a lot of ways, the Dharma is going to train part of us that has not been trained. Western schooling trains the intellect, not so much the character. And a lot of the values of Western training go against the values of the Dharma. So if we have any intelligence, we say, well, let's give it a try. Otherwise, you put up obstacles for yourself. Some of them come from the fact that we're operating by Western values. Others come from the fact that we've learned a bit about the Dharma, and it doesn't seem logical. And this is where you have to realize there's a difference between being logical and being reasonable. Being logical, you start out with certain basic assumptions, and then you reason from those assumptions. And sometimes the basic assumptions are wrong. Or just because something makes a nice logical structure doesn't mean it's right. Think about the definition of a farce. It's an illogical proposition carried to its logical conclusion. And a lot of people's logic is like that. And then there's some simple Western ideas that just don't fit in with the Dharma, like the idea that you should be independent, self-reliant. And here we have a community of people who are totally dependent on others for their food, clothing, and shelter. But you think about it, and you live in this community, and after all you begin to realize this is a good community for practicing the Dharma. Because we don't have to go out there and sell it to make a living. We live totally off of people's generosity. We learn how to keep our needs small so we don't burden them. And we find that by living off of guests, we can give the Dharma as a gift, which creates a special environment for learning the Dharma, teaching the Dharma. And you may not notice that immediately when you hear about how things are arranged. I know some lay Dharma teachers who complain about the fact that monks don't handle money. They say this makes them burdensome. But you have to remember the whole set of standards by which the Buddha taught his stepmother on how we can know what's Dharma and Vinaya. And one of them is that leads to dispassion. And this is where dispassion trumps unburdensomeness. Okay, we're, we do burden, some, burden people sometimes by the fact that we can't buy things. They have to buy them for us. Or we go someplace, somebody else has to carry the money. But as the Buddha said, if the monks could carry money, then all the pleasures of the senses would be available to them. So this keeps things in check. There's somebody else who knows what we're buying. So at the very least we have a sense of shame about buying things that would be inappropriate. That's a case where things on the outside may look a little bit unreasonable or illogical, but they are reasonable. There are also cases where we simply misunderstand the Dharma. Years back we had someone staying here who had practiced in a tradition where they translated the term Sakaya Ditti, the self-identity view, as personality view. And he'd been led to believe that part of the practice was trying to get rid of your personality, learning how to be affectless. And he was upset because the monks around here still had personalities. That's based on a, just a misunderstanding, of the mistranslation of the term, or especially the term Sila Pata Brahmasa, grasping at Sila and Bhatta. That's often translated as rites and rituals. But Sila doesn't mean right. It means either virtue or habit. And Bhatta means protocols, practices. And some people say, well, before I came here I didn't have any rites or rituals that I was involved in. 
suddenly coming to Buddhism, their rites and rituals. It doesn't seem right. But go back and retranslate the term. Before you came here, you had habits. Here we have other habits. You had other practices, here we have other practices. It's not that people who are totally devoid of rites and rituals have abandoned that fetter. They still have their habits. The thing is, their habits are not very well thought out, or they don't lead to the end of suffering. And same with their practices. Here we try to take, make use of habits and practices. We realize okay, they're not going to do all the work, but they're an important part of the work. After all, sila covers three factors of the Noble Path. We try to develop good habits and good practices, habits that are conducive to the end of suffering. And then we know when to pick them up and when to put them down. So we have to remember that practice leads to a goal, and it's aimed at a goal, and this is where the practice makes sense. And often it's when you get to the toward the end of the path that you realize how much sense it does make. This is not to say that it's not supposed to make sense beforehand, simply that you have to think about it, you have to expand your ideas of what it means to make sense. Now there is the difference between the culture in which the Buddha founded the Dharma and some of the cultures in which it's gone through. In India, there was a lot of intellectual ferment and a lot of challenging debaters. And the Buddha had to be very precise in his explanation of terms. He was very sophisticated in dealing with issues like that. And so basically he was ready for all, all comers, basically. You go through Thailand and there's less of a tradition of debate. In fact, in schools, students are discouraged from asking questions because it seems to imply that the teacher hasn't explained things properly. There's a passage where Ajahn Chah is asked about the difference between awareness itself and awakened awareness. He says, are these the same thing? Because oftentimes you listen to them and it sounds like they're the same thing. He said, no, of course not. Well, it took somebody who had the, the gumption to ask him. As all too often when you're in a, in a monastery like that, you're afraid to ask the teacher. So sometimes there is a greater role for questioning. than we might assume. I mean, coming here to the West has been good for me. I've learned how to think up reasons for things I simply accepted when I was over there. I remember getting off the plane one time in Dallas, the first time I came back alone. Come out of customs, there's this guy with long, frizzy hair comes up to me and says, Why are you monks bald-headed? Why do you shave your heads? He took one look at him and said, So we don't get lice. The look on his face was worth it. So there is room for challenging, for asking questions, but you do it in the context of respect. You listen to the teaching. You give it a try. You say, this must make sense somehow. And you learn. I remember John Fuhrman telling me that you always have to assume that when the teacher does something, he has a reason. He may not explain the reason, but you've got to figure it out. I know all too many Western monks went to Thailand and assumed that the reason the Ajans did things certain ways is because they were Thai. Which meant, of course, that if you're not Thai, you don't do them that way. You can do it some other way. But often there's a lot more going on. So there's room for questioning. After all, the Buddha said, if you don't question things, you're not going to understand them. But the questioning comes in that context of committing yourself to the practice, giving it a try. And if it doesn't work out, try to figure out why it's not working out. Then you ask questions. You're sure that you're taking this seriously. It's in that way that an attitude of respect is a sign of intelligence. It shows a willingness to learn and a willingness to put aside your preconceived notions.
try something out. And when a teacher sees that, he's happier to teach. So you're more open to learning and the teacher's more open to teaching. That's how an attitude of respect creates the right atmosphere for learning the Dharma that's really going to be useful for you.